Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sunil Sanghai. I'm part of Capital Markets Committee of FICI. A very warm welcome to this very special session with uh, Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam, Chief Economic Advisor of Government of India. He is not new to us. He has been uh, always obliging us through his address at the CAPM. He has spoken at the pre previous CAPMs also. Uh, Dr. Subramanyam, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. When I was putting down this introductory remark for Dr. Subramanyam, I had three data points. The first, his very excellent, well-written, impressive profile. The second, my personal interactions with him at various committees, etc., which I've worked with him. And the third was a really interesting one, a TED Talk which I came across, which Dr. Subramanyam delivered and i found that absolutely fascinating so ladies and gentlemen with his permission i'm going to talk to, to you about and pick up some of the points from the ted talk uh, and i'm sure you will find it interesting so with your humble background with average academic scores during school you decided to attempt iit and im and PhD from Chicago Booth School. And you succeeded in all of them just because of determination. And therefore, the four points which you laid out in your TED Talk are really very impressive. And I want to read those out to here. The first and very important one, to have the courage to live your own story, even when adverse circumstances may cry out for you to just follow the herd. Is so true. The second point, resilience is built not by pursuing instant gratification, but by having the stomach to sacrifices and delay gratification. It's absolutely true. We call it as a long-term greedy. And the third point which you make is follow your own story in pursuit of happiness and not in pursuit of power of, of self. And the final point, do not afraid of failure, even when the best of the metrics and the best of the people tell you that it may be good for you to settle for less. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, because it was uh, fascinating, I thought I would share with, uh, with everyone. I'm sure our economy is in the safe hands with Dr. Subramanam, with this background. At this point, I would like to mention though, that as a reader of economic surveys since the last several years, I really thank you for making it more interesting. And now we wait for the economic surveys rather than getting scared of its weight. In 2020 economic survey, you made a very bold statement on wealth creation and you laid out your reform agenda in 2020 as well as in 2021 economic survey. And now we see that playing out. And that's really happening to know both wealth creation and the reform agenda. We see what's happening in the market. Uh, in fact, we had a session, uh, Dr. Subhamanam, on, on this uh, yesterday, uh, which is entrepreneurship through private capital. Uh, and that was the point which was made in the economic survey. With that, may I now hand over to you for your address, Dr. Subhamanam. Thank you very much, Sunil. Um, I must say I'm very, very humbled by uh, your introduction and the amount of care that you've taken uh, to try and uh, find out something more uh, than what is there in the public domain usually. So uh, I'm really grateful to you for that. Uh, yes, indeed, um, I am very proud of the background that I come from. Um, it helps me. Uh, you know, understand the common person's uh, pain, and uh, maybe it is that that background that uh, the one aspect that my father used to always keep uh, saying. You know, when I started <laughs> learning Sanskrit for the first time in CBSE, you start learning when you were in class six. You know, he he gave me the Bhagavad Gita and asked me to read that. I was barely able to read it, 
but uh, you know the bhagavad gita as a as a guide uh, has stayed with me because of that maybe you know uh, that that gesture of his and he used to always uh, mention that dharma is what is you know the most important um, and i think as as an economic policy maker it is indeed our dharma to make sure that the taxpayers money is treated with at least the same respect you know ideally even more respect than our own money and i think that is basically the dharma um, all of us here in in government and i must mention that this is it is always a team effort um, you know uh, uh, i've had the the privilege of a lot of support from everyone in being able to bring out the economic surveys and so you know and and uh, one can only write things eventually decision makers have to make those decisions and so you know uh, um, the fact that some of those thoughts have been actually um, you know the, have been listened to is credit to the decision makers themselves um, so thank you very much once again for inviting me and uh, uh providing me this platform to share my thoughts um i'll uh maybe speak for 20 25 minutes and i want to focus on um, primarily on the economic recovery uh that is on and uh, um yes it has been impacted by the you know the momentum of the recovery that we were seeing in the second half of the year has been uh you know had impacted or or had been impacted by the second wave you know so there so for a couple of months uh, there was um, some you know um uh, uh, some lowering of that momentum but we are again picking up steam um so uh, one thing i will mention you know um all through in giving my assessments you know not only before the pandemic but after the pandemic as well i have relied on evidence and i will also you know um in in some sense i've had the privilege of being able to walk what i actually spoke about in the ted talk which is you know to have the conviction actually so i for instance have not been uh, drawn into a lot of the of the uh, uh, doomsday predictions that have been made that had been made about the economy um you know around last march april etc by many commentators um you know based on my own conviction my own understanding of the indian economy um and uh, the the data that we track um we track close to 60 high frequency indicators um i have uh, considered it my duty to actually you know give a uh, assessment that i think is right um and even if that may be actually different from the herd uh here i am reminded of uh, a couple of behavioral biases that uh, you know behavioral economics talks about one is often times um, during periods of extreme uncertainty uh, it is human tendency to try and herd with you know and 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 you know be part of the of the crowd um and as a result even balanced assessments often times can appear you know uh, um a more more optimistic so i think that is a bias that you know i must uh, mention and secondly often times a lot of assessments suffer from what is called the saliency bias which is that the latest observation is um you know taken into account a lot more than uh, than than the um, you know than the trend that is prevailing and i i will use the example because this is you know take for instance the r assessments and compare it to for instance the you know the imf assessment um you know at the start of the year there was 12.5% and then they've you know brought it down to 9.5% if you look at rbi's assessment or or our own assessments and you know our assessment has been that this impact of the second wave will not be as large and we had kept it so we were certainly we didn't you know go as aggressive as to say that the you know growth will be 12.5% nor do we now think that the you know the the, the revision should be as large as as you know as they have done which is um, you know some of the saliency bias that i that i that i want to highlight which as analysts as commentators we have to be careful about um with those a couple of caveats let me actually uh, get into some of the details uh, i think first point that i want to mention is that the 
uh, economy in the um, you know in the last year uh, indeed had a v shaped recovery now when you unpack and look across sectors as etc you know uh, we can we can possibly uh, debate about some of the other aspects but at the macro economic level when you look at gdp growth or several other indicators and uh, those for those who actually would like to see the evidence i would suggest take a look at the latest you know the economic survey and the may edition of the monthly economic report the, every month the ministry of finance brings out this report so take a look at the very first chart in the in the uh, monthly economic report so after the 24.4% decline in the first quarter india actually had indeed a v shaped recovery uh, and and those of you who track my media interactions will recall that after the first quarter results were out i did mention that by looking at the high frequency indicators there is a v shaped recovery that is on and we are glad that that indeed transpired um the you know 7.5% uh, for q2 uh, 0.4% for q3 and 1.6% for q4 and there as well actually there is a story within the story which we have to acknowledge uh, for the third and the fourth quarter the gda change is a much better indicator of economic performance because gdp is gva plus taxes minus subsidies uh, because of the high subsidies in the pandemic year and the you know the back loading of that in q3 and q4 as well as the change in the you know uh, accounting the, the government of india's accounting as mentioned in the budget all of balance sheet items being brought on balance sheet the gva change is a much more much better reflection of the e economic performance for the third and fourth quarter so if you take that and you know assess it actually you know third and fourth quarter is 1.6% and 3.7% and i must mention that if you actually go and look at the four quarter numbers four quarters in the pandemic india is the only country that has registered two consecutive quarters of growth only country and i think that is actually indicative of the you know uh, resilience of the indian economy which is basically what has led to the to the to the v shaped recovery um so uh, in in the fourth quarter as well you know the emphasis on capital expenditures which is one of the key aspects of our policy initiative uh, because a uh, capex driven growth actually leads to sustained economic growth as we had shown in the 2018-19 survey um so if you look at the q4 numbers for instance um af you know uh, the the gross fixed capital formation to gdp ratio which is a measure of the investment rate in the economy was at a 6 and a half year high at 34.3% was a 6 and a half quarter high in other words highest among you know among the highest in the in the last 26 quarters um so um, the result of that was construction activity grew at almost 15% which is really important from you know job creation in the informal sector because um, you know especially the urban poor really uh, um, you know uh, really uh, uh, are involved in the in construction activities and jobs in the informal sector are are you know created a lot by the construction uh, you know construction activity so it growing at 14 and 1/2% almost 15% was salient which led to you know uh, consumption itself growing at 2.7% after three quarters of decline in consumption and uh, similarly the uh, uh, contact sensitive sectors actually after having registered degrowth in the high double digits um, in previous three quarters registered a degrowth of only 2.3% um, if you look at the gst numbers as well sub starting from september onwards uh, and gst number is something that we all must track very closely because it's a consumption based tax gst is a consumption based tax and therefore it is actually a revealed preference measure it reveals the actual consumption that is happening in the economy because you know there's nothing better than actual money compared to you know a survey measures can have biases but actual money that is paid as consumption tax is you know is is revealing of consumption so the fact that you know every month starting from september onwards gst was uh, you know at least 1 lakh crores and hitting the high, you know record high of 1.5 lakh 1.4 lakh crore for the uh, month transaction for the month of march in the month of uh, you know the june the numbers that have come 92000 crores which is for transactions in the month of may even that at 92000 crores actually tells you that the therefore the impact of the second wave actually is not as as you know as pronounced as was the impact of the first wave 
primarily because uh, the second wave was much shorter in duration, about six to eight weeks, because the rise was very, you know, uh, very, very steep. The decline has been as steep as well. Um, as a result, while the first wave extended for six months, the second wave was for six to eight weeks. Second, restrictions were placed at the state level. As a result, they were asynchronous in time and they were also heterogeneous in their intensity as well. Um, as in, and, 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 you know, essentials were not impacted. Interstate activity was also not impacted. So the GST numbers are basically reflecting that, that, that as well. So you know, the first point, therefore, I want to mention is that there has been a V-shaped recovery in the, you know, last year. Uh, yes, you know, uh, the, the, when you, when you start unpacking across some sectors, especially listed firms, large firms have done, you know, really well, they have deleveraged, they, you know, they basic, their bottom lines have improved, you know, uh, um, but, but some of the smaller firms are impacted more. Similarly, you know, people at the, uh, um, you know, at, at the bottom of the pyramid have been impacted more, especially in urban areas, urban poor. Uh, so, you know, some commentators, you know, will say, therefore, it's a K-shaped recovery, given that some people, you know, some, some, uh, you know, uh, but that's more at the sectoral level, you know, uh, at the macro level, clearly, it's, it's been a V-shaped shaped recovery and, and the government has indeed taken steps to actually address some of those sectors that are particularly impacted and you know we can talk about that if there are some questions specifically relating to that um, but i think the major point is that the, the recovery has been sound there has been the momentum of that actually has been you know affected for instance counterfactually or hypothetically if the second wave had not happened the momentum would have continued and actually that may have been but you know uh, the the second wave indeed did happen was devastating from the health perspective but from a, from the economic perspective impact has not been as as large um, and and the next point i want to make actually is there is a you know there is a, a talk of third wave um, and i think you know we all need to continue following all the COVID protocols. But I have two points to make from the perspective of the economy, you know, in, in the context of the of a third wave. First, as it has been the case, um, uh, you know, across the globe, economic prospects are inextricably linked to the to the pandemic itself. Uh, and so, you know, what is the likelihood of a third wave and how intense will it be is very important for us to understand before we can actually, you know, anticipate or, or project on the economic impact. So here I would like to, you know, and I first let me admit that I am not the expert I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a consumer of the research on epidemiology, very voracious consumer, albeit, but still not the producer of such research, unlike in economics. And so I'm not the expert. Please do follow the directions that come from epidemiologists, but I'm going to give an assessment based on my reading of the data, you know, in this area. So firstly, about you know, we have vaccinated uh, close to 45 crore people now. Uh, you know, and and which is about forty percent of the you know of of the adult population. Um, that's point number one. One one shot. Um, secondly, the ICMR survey serological prevalence uh, is about 67 percent across the country and seventy percent in urban areas. And so urban areas are important because of from the economic perspective. Now, uh, Lancet and the British Medical Journal. There are articles that have come over the last. A uh, few months showing that even in the context of the Delta Plus variant, if let's if people have been you know have antibodies, in other words, they have the uh, you know they've been infected and they've gotten one shot, um, then you know that that is that is basically equivalent to uh, you know the immunity received from two shots. Also, other research uh, similarly published in these outlets uh, suggests that. The, you know, once you get infected, the antibodies stay for about at least six months. Some, some say show it's about eight months. So I think when you take all this into account and our target to really, uh, you know, vaccinate uh, of the, of the entire adult population by December, uh, you know, by which time, I, but at least till that time, the impact of the antibodies actually from infection must stay. When you put these together, you start seeing that we may be close to herd immunity. Uh, this is not to say that we should not follow COVID protocols. I think we should be following, but we should actually, you know, uh, um, while taking all the necessary care, as they, as they say in risk management, you know, uh, you know, if you have to have return, you have to have take well-managed uh, 
uh, you know, you have to manage your risk well. So, you know, follow all the protocols, but at the same time, do keep in mind that some of these statistics suggest that the intensity of the of a third wave, if it happens, may not be that large. Here, if you look at UK, for instance, you know, compare the second wave and the third wave. The deaths were proportional to their cases in the second wave. But third wave, if you look at, you know, in actual cases, the first 50 days, the numbers for cases are, are almost identical for second wave and third wave in the UK. But deaths are much, much smaller, um, you know, and hospitalizations are also much, much smaller. So I think this is something which you have to keep in mind. Um, so as a result, I, you know, some in substance of this is that even if there is a third wave, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the, the, these facts suggest that the intensity of that may be lower. That's point number one. Second, as was with the second wave, the economic impact was much smaller because, you know, not only India, but other countries have actually learned how to minimize the economic impact by having restrictions more at the local levels, you know, state levels, etc. So, you know, the learnings from the second wave will be useful even if there is a third wave. So, bottom line, even if there is a third wave, the intensity may be lower, uh, but do keep in mind, follow epidemiologists, uh, you know, uh, uh, guidance not mine um, and second that the, the economic impact therefore should be much lower and we may be very close to herd immunity therefore so i think contact sensitive sectors etc you know the demand there can actually start increasing so that's sort of the the, the you know in terms of the pandemic itself so uh, our assessment is that the growth projections that we have had done for the budget's growth projection of 10 and a half percent we should be in that ballpark you know and i'm not saying that we may have exactly that number but we should be, you know, the growth should be in that ballpark. And so we should have a high growth rate, you know, for, for, for this year. Um, and now let me just, and this will be the last part of my, um, you know, my, my, my thoughts, and then you can have uh, questions. So uh, in terms of the growth prospects itself, um, and here I think the most important thing to take into account when we talk about growth prospects, there are two parts that I want to, you know, uh, focus on. One is, the, the policy itself that we are doing that we have implemented that policy itself has two parts to it which is the capex driven you know uh, growth which as we know uh, you know capital and as, as i talked about from the fourth quarter numbers capex creates demand in the informal sectors and that is important because informal sector is the one that actually you know gets impacted usually uh, uh, you know uh, in in crisis like this so capex driven recovery therefore actually is quite important that's one part of the policy push second part is all the supply all the supply side and refor reforms that you know whether it's labor reform the you know enterprise policy focused on the private sector the uh, you know uh, ex pli scheme for exports the liberalization of um, you know in several sectors power for instance you know mining uh, uh, cryptography uh, you know defense production you know these are all these actually opening up of many of those sectors um, uh, when you put all these together lots of reforms actually you know and and i will mention on the reforms that a lot of people now romantically look back 30 years you know uh, ago um, i was a, a student then actually but because you know an engineering student but because of my interest in economics used to read you know the pink newspapers and i remember that you know um, while now we can romantically reminisce um, at that time when the reforms were being done there was intense opposition to those reforms including from the ruling party itself there was a particular trio of people in the you know in the ruling party very senior people which whom i don't want to name but i'm sure you know uh, there are enough books that talk about them who were vehemently opposed to the reforms in the ruling party itself um, and you know only a few people saw the benefits that actually will come from those reforms most people were actually far more you know uh, um, doubtful about the, the the positive impact and i think there is an important learning there uh, there are you know some people who actually may not be as convinced about the impact of these reforms but i think you know at least when one talks to industry folks and those of us you know uh, uh, in the in the government we are absolutely convinced that these reforms are as path breaking as the 1991 reforms itself and will indeed have uh, the impact on investment and on productivity itself so the combination of rise in investment you know and uh, productivity i you know i, I expect that from uh, in FY23, we expect growth between six and a half to seven percent, and accelerate there, you know, thereafter uh, to to go towards eight percent. And here, you know, I must mention that you will hear about 
terms like hysteresis, etc., you know, which is uh, oftentimes used to assess advanced economies. And actually, I say this having, you know, uh, 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 followed the research in this very, very carefully. I, I think it's important to understand the difference between, uh, you know, hysteresis that happens in an advanced economy and that in a country like India, emerging economy, where there's a lot more, you know, the inf informal sector. Uh, hysteresis happens when you have actually balance sheets that come really under stress. The cost of financial distress manifests, you know, you have basically uh, um, firms, therefore, not being able to carry out their operations. That's primarily not being able to carry out their operations because of the cost of financial distress. This happens for formal sector firms who's pay, who have balance sheets, actually. Now, the good thing in the Indian context is that the formal sector actually has done, you know, pretty well, at, at, you know, through the through the crisis. And so this part of hysteresis that is applicable for advanced economies is something that, you know, should be very quite, quite low for the for the, you know, um, for, for the Indian economy. As for the informal sector, the informal sector, when you think about production using both labor and capital, you know, it's far more labor intensive. They use much less capital and far more labor. And as a result, you know, when the economic activities come back, they can immediately start, you know, operations and sort of get back to uh, and and oftentimes even a lot of informal mechanisms that actually, you know, uh, um, uh, thereby sort of cushion some of this impact and something that we must keep in mind when we talk about the, you know, uh, uh, and I think that is sort of a, a, a very important aspect generally, uh, especially commentators who read, you know, literature from the advanced economies. It is important to read that, but at the same time also extrapolate and take into account the differences, you know, uh, economic trade-offs and economic phenomena remain the same across countries. But when, you know, uh, institutional features and boundary conditions are different, the impacts may be different, which is something we have to keep in mind. So uh, overall, therefore, you know, I do think that we should be able to actually hit high growth rates, um, you know, uh, through in, in higher investment rates and, you know, more productivity from privatization, asset monetization, the, uh, you know, uh, increase in size of firms, exports, etc. Et uh, going forward. So I do, I, you know, I, I'm convinced that this decade will be a decade of, of you know, really high growth for India. Um, with those words, uh, let me let me uh, thank the organizers once again for inviting me and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. This was absolutely brilliant, Dr. Subramanian. Um, I will turn to Mr. Dilip Shanoi, uh, Secretary General of FICI, uh, for uh, his interaction with you. Uh, uh, but there are a couple of points which I wanted to make. Yeah, right? please, uh, Mr. Sange, you can take the question answer session. I'll thank him towards the end if you can moderate the question answer session. Yeah. Right? Okay, right. Oh, and that's brilliant. Um, in the lighter vein, uh, like you, I have been also reading the pink newspaper. But those days, I think, if I recall it correctly, uh, the color is to be white. So, <laughs> uh, you got me there. So, uh, one one point I saw, I, I realized I was keeping the time that almost eighty percent of your speech was focused on pandemic. It's so important. It is because it is so important. It's overarching the entire impact on 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 the economy, uh, and that is the, precisely the reason we had we started the day today with a session on vaccination uh, with Dr. Krishna Ella of Bharat Biotech. Uh, he spent an hour with us uh, and he said the same thing, 45 crores people have been vaccinated. Um, he also said that, look, if we do not see intense wave three, then by Diwali, we should be okay. Uh, he also said that he is in advanced stages of uh, working on two to 12 years age. Uh, bracket uh, where hopefully that vaccine should come out. Uh, uh, so that's progressing well. And once that comes, then we will be able to cover the the other other part of the population also. So so that should give a lot of comfort and therefore to the economy, right? 
Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I'm firstly, uh, Sunil, I'm glad that, you know, two independent opinion. I have, you know, not had any interactions with him. So, you know, his assessment and my assessment independently, of course, he is the expert, you know, in, in this area. I am, you know, a, as I said, only a consumer of this research, but I think it's very, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it gives a lot of confidence to, uh, you know, to all of us to see that independent assessments are actually similar. Um, I think there is yeah. a good likelihood that while maintaining the necessary caution, uh, we can, you know, get back to um, uh, normal economic activity, um, you know, and I think it's a matter of just following some of the simple protocols, right? Simple aspects, yeah. you know, make sure we actually have the mask um, and maintain distance. I think, you know, it's uh, and, and of course, washing hands, etc. with that. We can resume, uh, you know, uh, normal activity in a lot of uh, aspects, and the third wave actually may therefore may not be that intense at all. Um, I think uh, so. That's yeah. it's very gratifying actually to to, to hear uh, you summarize what you know happened in the first session. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to send his video, but he dealt with a lot of things. He talked about nasal nasal vaccine, which is progressing very well and is very easy to administer. Uh, the transportation storage, all of that becomes easy in that case. And then uh, he also talked about for children, he talked about the next level and all of that and Delta variant as well. He gave a lot of inputs on the Delta variant. And I think one could derive a lot of comfort and you can definitely put those thinking in your economic policies and all. One question, I'm getting some questions also, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you have any question, please send it in through the chat box or through one of our colleagues so that uh, we can put it up here. Um, one question which is uh, which is coming up, and I guess this is from media. Um, you touched upon IMF, which has just happened. Uh, IMF's view on the, they've revised the number downward a bit because of the wave two, as you rightly mentioned. Uh, but there is also a chatter review about uh, uh, inflation. Okay, uh, when I know at some point of time we might get into the inflationary situation, uh, what's your view around that? Because that may have an Im implication uh, on overall growth plus also on the capital market. Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to take it in two parts. Um, one on global inflation and second on domestic inflation. Um, I think global inflation. Uh, there are uh, there are multiple factors at play. Um, of course, you know because um, except India, most other countries, you know, their policies have all been demand driven. Um, and you know, we know from Econ 101 when you only increase demand without without changing supply, then you know you you do face the prospect of a price rise and inflation um, and that's where india has been different that we've actually you know focused on supply and on demand and demand in a more you know directed manner um, so so you know i'll come to that when i talk about domestic inflation but globally that's one part but at the same time you know while the united states seem to be actually seems to be you know uh, um, uh, well positioned for high growth uh, you know, I, there there are some question marks, at least in my mind, with some of the other you know adv advanced economies. So uh, there is some opposing forces there, which we actually, when we look at it in terms of commodity prices and um, global commodity prices and global inflation itself. Um, uh, but I think you know, in on balance, taking into account all these factors, this year global inflation will be higher than what we've you know seen for a, for 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 a while. That is my my assessment. Um, as for inflation in India, I think there are a couple of aspects that we must uh, you know keep in mind. One, uh, if you go back to the period during the first wave, for nine months we had inflation that was above six percent. So on average, you know, uh, uh, during that time it was about uh, between six to six point five. That kind of you know. Um, so for nine months it was above. Uh, six percent, and that was primarily because of the, you know, the the supply side frictions that that manifested. For instance, just take a, you know, a very common thing that uh, if you have onions that have to be shipped, let's say from somewhere in Maharashtra to let's say, you know, to uh, Madhya Pradesh somewhere, let's say, you know, in Madhya Pradesh, then they have to travel. These trucks have to travel in the night, 
and when night travel actually does not happen then there is there will be wastage which then basically reduces supply and you know demand being some of these actually demand does not change that fast so reduction in supply demand remaining the same you actually have you know price price increases so that sort of an illustration of the supply side frictions that you know uh, that that manifest due to uh, some of the necessary steps that had to be taken during the pandemic uh, the second wave um, you know did have some of those restrictions but as we discussed earlier the um, first uh, the, the duration of the second wave was lower um and you know as we discussed actually the overall restriction is also lower and were heterogeneous across states so i do think therefore that the uh, the may and june prints that have come above 6% um you know i i i anticipate that uh, maybe this month or you know uh, next month i anticipate it should be less than 6% you know uh, uh, with with reasonable probability i expect this month also the print to come to be less than 6% uh, when the may print had come you know above had come 6.4% i had mentioned internally that uh, this should moderate um, you know even 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 with with in deliberations uh, you know with with uh, regulators as well um, and uh, i think and, and and if you saw the sequential momentum did go down um, you know and the core inflation also has actually has decreased so um, i think so far uh, the assessment and what has transpired seems to be actually in sync Uh, which gives me confidence that going forward as well inflation should be rate bound um, you know uh, despite some of the rise in commodity prices etc i think it should be within the with, within the range for domestic inflation uh, you know i think may it's it's likely to be more between between 5 and 6% um, but certainly you know will be will be uh, you know in, in in the range of 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 is be 2 to 6% <clears throat> so within the tolerance limit of rbi 4 plus 2 exactly plus exactly. 2 minus yeah so 4 plus minus 2 4 minus 2 yeah plus minus um what i'm trying to do is there are several questions so i'm just going to put them in the themes and i don't think we have time for more than two um uh, one theme which is related to i think what they're trying to ask uh, international partnership essentially they're asking around china that all that which is happening with china uh, and how do you see both investment and trade with china getting impacted in some bit uh, how do you see that is, that having an impact on the economy so um this is sort of i'm i'm, I'm you know um giving an assessment for how the covid and um, you know related aspects um uh, will sort of affect the world order my sense is that and if you can see even from some recent you know st some statements yesterday and today um you can see that there is a, a cleavage um you know into two sets of countries um one uh, those that are transparent democracies uh, that will play by the rule of law and second those that are non democracies uh, you know a lot more opaque um, and possibly not ones that are actually you know uh, uh, known for playing by the rule of law uh, at least international you know in international fora um, i think you know there will be a separation along those lines um, and i if, if you look at the you know the the uh, the initiative on the quad and um, you know some of those aspects again you know this is also i will caution that i am not a, a global policy expert i'm not a foreign policy expert but this is based on again reading of of you know um, that's the expectation that i have um uh, as a result i think india will benefit therefore from trading you know with with countries that are far more sympathetic to you know um, to 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 basically the kind of um, values that we espouse um, and uh, i th i think that is the way i i i foresee um, you know uh, this aspect uh as i said we have this time for one more so let me just package two three themes into one so i guess what they are trying to ask the because we had secretary deep on yesterday at the conference and uh, and, uh, and he sounded very positive about the disinvestment program etc uh in case there is a revenue shortfall 
and there's a question around BPCL and all of that. If there is a if there is a shortfall in this investment, and therefore there would be a shortfall on the revenue, though there is a uh, makeup happening from the GST collection, we'll have to see for the next few sure. months. Um, what's the thought? Because in any case, deficit is so high, there is very little room really to bridge that gap. Maybe then the expenditure cut, which will then in, in, re, impact the economy negatively. Uh, and I'm sure you are thinking about it every day uh, if you want to share. And before I hand over to SG, I would definitely want some peek into the new, the next economic survey because we are always <laughs> interested in that. Um. So, so your second question. Let me, uh, you know, mention it off the off off immediately. You know, it's too early. Um, so, yeah. as for the, so let me let me, you know, mention my overall assessment, and I'll give you the reasons for that assessment. I don't, you know, anticipate um, us breaching that six point eight percent, you know, fiscal deficit target. Number one. Uh, number two, Sunil, I would want to correct that. You know, uh, this perception that it is too high it's not actually you know if you look at it from the perspective of our, you know if you take ims fiscal monitor for instance um, and look at our peers right our, you know if anything we actually are are you know um, are are you know, much more comfortable on that on that aspect because we have been very judicious in the way you know we have basically uh, uh, done the fiscal interventions and um, as i had mentioned in an art written in an article in the times of india as well We've used a lot more of the, you know, information from the financial sector to really direct the, you know, the the the, the interventions. Uh, and you know, having learned from some of the mistakes that happened after the global financial crisis, where unconditional, you know, revenue expenditure really actually created a triple whammy, whammy of very high inflation, you know, runaway inflation, uh, high fiscal deficit, much higher than peer economies, and uh, you know, very high current account deficit, which eventually led to the taper tantrum. So, um, you know, based on that, actually, we have um, so so you know, we we've done what we think is absolutely important. Actually, you know, and, and which is you know, and we've done the needful, in my opinion, on the fiscal side. Directed it very carefully. Um, as for possibility of of cut in expenditure, I will mention that that is also quite unlikely because see, uh, there are you know one of the key things that actually and you know and you know, among the the budgets that I was part of, this budget you know uh, I will say gave me the maximum satisfaction because. This is a this was a budget really of under promising and trying to over deliver. Um, you know, for instance, the 1.75 lakh crore, you know, uh, um, disinvestment revenue does not include uh, the privatization of the two public sector banks or the insurance company. Uh, similarly, among the non non tax receipts, you know, any revenue that is likely to come from asset monetization. And, you know, recently we had some, you know, work on this being done by niti ayog as well and you know there is there is a likelihood of of some of, of you know reasonable proceeds from asset monetization as well which has not been you know uh, uh, factored in so apart from the fact that overall if we look at the advanced tax payments itself which look pretty you know pretty promising you know on the on the corporate tax side uh, so uh, direct taxes and indirect taxes as you mentioned in your question itself i do anticipate that from the coming, you know, from this month onwards, we should be getting back to one lakh uh, crore plus again, um, and uh, we, we, I think we should be able to get the average of September to March, September 2020 to March 2021. That average we should be able to get. So when you put those together, direct taxes, you know, which actually are looking much better, indirect taxes, your GST, uh, we haven't, you know, factored in the. You know, either the privatization or in the financial sector or any any proceeds from asset monetization. Uh, these are all basically these will, will be the icing on the cake. Some things that so there is uh, you know there is headroom clearly you know in in this aspect. Um, and and so I don't anticipate us either have you know breaching the fiscal deficit or cutting down on expenditure. Uh, if anything, you know, and and you must have all everybody. I'm sure would have tracked the statements by the honourable honourable finance minister that we are looking to front load the capital expenditure, uh, you know, and and do it as much in you know in in Q2 and Q3 
rather than wait for Q4, so that some of the big effects that we saw in Q4 of last year, which I mentioned, you know, the construction activity, the uh, you know consumption, um, you know, the the uh, intensive sectors, um, you know, your uh, uh, contact intensive sectors, etc. When you put those together, we you know the reason we want to front load the capital expenditures is so that same effects we can have it in Q2 and Q3 as well. So uh, bottom line, I don't expect us breaching 6.8%, nor do I expect us to actually, you know, cut down on expenditures, especially on the capital expenditures. You know, um, some pruning on the revenue expenditures, which was already that had started some bit, you know, only on the wasteful, wasteful spending, but certainly not on not on capex. Given the you know clear buy-in uh, and and the, the you know the conviction in the government that capex is incredibly important for sustained recovery. That's very reassuring. So thank you, uh, Dr. Subramaniam. I know that uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, you have another engagement to go to, and therefore, you know, first of all, you know, uh, I must tell everyone here that the last time we met was physically in the Fiki office, and that was just at the start of the second wave. And while he was develop uh, delivering the Netaji Memorial lecture that time, you know, all the calls I was getting was for hospital admissions and hospital beds from various people and it became very distracting and you know, really apologies for that. But nobody knew at that point of time how, you know, sharp and vicious the second wave uh, would be uh, there. But, you know, in your usual, very nice style saying that, you know, you know, you're relying on other people's uh, other people's data, other people's analysis, especially in the healthcare thing. And we are aware of how you push the IIT team with McKinsey to give you some early indicators of uh, you know the second wave there uh, you have very nicely reassured us that second the third wave if possible may not be as intense or as uh, you know hard hitting on the health front as well as the economic front uh, for india uh, there you have actually raised expectations of you know 6.8 to 7 to even 8% growth you know fi23 uh, going uh, forward uh, you said it was early for the economic survey, but I think, you know, from uh, Mr. Sanghai's point of view, he would be looking at, you know, do we have the capital, uh, adequate capital infrastructure and capital resources for becoming a $5 trillion, uh, you know, economy going forward? You have done a lot of work on this, and, you know, we have discussed this uh, earlier. But I think, you know, the bottom line is really how do we find uh, out of box solutions for raising capital resources for India's development uh, process going forward? Thank you for your reassuring words on inflation. A lot of industry is was worried about the inflation. You, do, you know, you actually have talked about it there. As usual, very simply put, deep messages. And it's always a pleasure listening to you and interacting with you. And you, you know, you actually, in your question and answers, you're direct and candid and give us a lot of hope for the future. So thank you, uh, Dr. Trishwati Subramaniam, for being with us this afternoon. And thank you, Sunil Sangai, Abha, Chiku, and Jyoti for putting this together. Thank you very much, Dilip. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, stay healthy. Thank you, sir. Thank you.